Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my pleasure to say hello this fine morning and uh, welcome you all to a book talk on systemic corruption in America and what might be done. It is great to see you all bright and early. I'm not sure if we're the first ones to kick off any corruption day here at the East Coast. I suspect we may not. But what I know for sure is that there is others who will have a multitude of events uh, later today. You could even try to catch Sarah Chase a second time today over uh, at the Fletcher School with our friends there. However, I will suggest you stick with us. Why? Because we also have Millen and you won't get him over there. My name is Johannes Ton. I lead Global Integrity's work on anti-corruption. And it is my pleasure to introduce both Sarah Chase, author of the book on corruption in America, and Milan Vaishnev, senior fellow and director of the South Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace today, who have both graciously agreed to discuss Sarah's book. Before I do that introduction, I wanna give you just a little bit of background as to why we, Global Integrity, and two of our programs, the Open Government Hub and the Global Integrity Anti-Corruption Evidence Program, are keen and excited to be hosting this event. At Global Integrity, we very much work to encourage our partners to tackle complex and systemic corruption and governance challenges throughout the world. Importantly, however, we have always stressed that it can't be just a focus on corruption elsewhere, but that it must be a high priority to tackle corruption right here at home in the US. One of the outflows of this thinking has been our Defending Democracy program that we have run over the past four years, very much responding to a real risk that the current administration has posed. Acknowledging corruption in that administration, however, falls very much short of the grander recognition that corruption is a systemic problem that transcends administrations. For that reason, it is so timely and very important to take a look at Sarah's book and follow her thinking and her analysis, unapologetic, unapologetic and certainly a deep dive into the systemic factors of corruption here in America, in order to glimpse parts of, the pro, parts of the problem and to then start thinking about possible solutions. The Open Government Hub is a program that brings together organizations to work together on open governance. And perhaps we hope it can, and perhaps has done its, its part to point us all toward ways of how we might better tackle systemic corruption. The Global Integrity Anti-Corruption Evidence Program is a, pro a program that aims to understand the political drivers of corruption with the goal to then provide actionable evidence to practitioners and advocates to become more effective in fighting corruption. Taken together, we think that there is much to learn from Sarah's book and we hope to engage ourselves, but also you as the audience in a reflection process to really think about what might be done to tackle systemic corruption. Enough about the why as to why we're hosting this event. Over to Sarah and Millen, and I'll give you a little bit of an introduction of who they are in order to then pass it to them to lead us through the discussion today. Sarah is an incredibly sharp thinker and a devoted practitioner, unafraid to voice her thinking. She has worked around the world in various capacities on development and especially in Afghanistan later as a special advisor to the military thinking through corruption problems in Afghanistan. She then moved on to advise the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mike Mullen at the time. After leaving the Pentagon, she had a five year stint at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, a uh, time that she took to write a second book, which we're not discussing today, which is called Thieves of State. And also very, I highly recommend reading this. That book operates at the nexus between corruption and international security. But again, today we'll be on corruption in America. So that's the book that just came out. On to Milan Vaishnav, he is a senior fellow and director of the South Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and he teaches at Georgetown. He has written extensively on corruption, on governance, on state capacity, distributive politics, and electoral behavior. His interest centers very much on India and the US, and he frequently uses a comparative lens to negotiate between, to the, system, between the two systems, exploring all of the systemic questions that we grapple with today, including in this book talk. If there's one message to take away from this introduction, we have two extremely smart, versed, and kind people 
to guide us through the discussion today. I'm very grateful for them taking the time and I look forward to the next hour. Thank you, take it away. Thank you so much, Johannes. Uh, welcome everyone. It's a real honor and a pleasure to moderate this book discussion with my good friend, Sarah Chase. I don't think that the organizers when they invited me knew that uh, Sarah and I have a backstory. We were uh, partners in crime at the Carnegie Endowment when, when uh, Sarah graced us with her presence and uh, have, have become good friends and colleagues uh, ever since then. So Sarah, congratulations on the book. I remember when this was a kind of glimmer in your eye and to sort of sort of see it now as a living, breathing thing is, is quite an amazing feeling. Uh, let me just begin this conversation by kind of bringing the audience on your journey, as it were. You know, mm. your first book, The Punishment of Virtue, was about your decade-long stint in Afghanistan, where you, you know, you landed up as a journalist, you went to running a women's cooperative, to advising the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, as Johannes mentioned. Uh, your most, your second book, Thieves of State, was takes us on a whirlwind tour, really linking everything from the Protestant Reformation to the Arab Spring and how the nexus of corruption and instability operate. Uh, this new book has a, a uh, I want to say, uh, eclectic quality like Thieves of State does, but with the United States very firmly as the, the, the kind of primary target. What was this sort of eureka moment for mm. you when you realized, you know what, uh, I've been spending a lot of time about, uh, on the governance and corruption fight around the world. Uh, the real fight, as it were, is in my mm. backyard. Mm. Uh, and mm. this is where I need to turn my attention. Thanks. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it is sort of two eureka moments, uh, one from Afghanistan to the world and then back from the world to the United States. You're exactly right. And I'd also like to just throw my thanks into the pot to, you know, the folks who are online with us this morning. It's, you know, you all have a lot to do and uh, Zoom events can get old. And so we really appreciate your spending some time with us focused on this incredibly important issue. Um, it, it, you're right. I mean, I didn't intend to think about corruption in Afghanistan even when I was there. I was doing reconstruction. I thought that's what the issue was. I was you know, interested in how the Muslim world and the West were going to negotiate their um, involvement with each other on this planet for the, you know, foreseeable future. They are both civilizations that have a lot to learn from and teach each other. I had no intent or even acknowledgement of corruption as being an issue. It was Afghans who brought it to me. And they, you know, that's all they could talk about. And I was just about the only American they could get their hands on because I lived downtown and I didn't have barbed wire and I talked spoke Pashto so they could come to me and they expected me to bring their concerns to American officials. So I started doing that, got very involved in that. And then it was around, I think 2010, I gave a talk. I mean, it was on the drug trade in at the, um, you know, at a US training facility for foreign military and police. And I just couldn't resist a, throwing a couple of slides in there about how the drug trade is really just a facet of the revenue streams that are captured by uh, corrupt networks. And man, I had a line, you know, backed up at the end of the thing with all these different people saying, you just described my country, you just described my country, you just described my country. And I was like, whoa, this isn't just an Afghanistan phenomenon. This is, you know, a feature in, you know, there, right there, I had half a dozen countries, most of which also had a violent religious insurgency. And so that's, that was really the foundation of the thinking that went into Thieves of State, which was the connection between um, the indignation of the victims of systemic corruption and extreme reactions on their part, be it 
violent religious extremism, or be it insurrections that seem to be more civic, but then spin out of control, like, you know, Syria and Libya or Ukraine that spin out of control into other, um, other security challenges. By the end of that book, I was already thinking, uh-oh, the United States is on this continuum. And I wrote a little epilogue, which was basically approaching the United States geographically, Iceland, Ireland, and the United States. And I really focused on the 2008 financial meltdown, which to me seemed to be an, ex uh, uh, an example of the impact of systemic corruption on economies and, and of course, political systems. And my message was, watch out, we're on the railroad tracks toward the kind of extremist explosion that I've seen in places like Afghanistan. I would submit that the voting patterns in 2016 may be an expression of that kind of an extremist reaction, um, meaning it's sort of extremist voting. Um, but by 2016, even before the election, um, so I, w I wasn't predicting what form that extreme reaction would take, but I think you have to argue that, although I don't compare the two, the vote for both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump were so outside the, the expected mainstream of how Americans would be voting that it sort of is a slight extreme reaction. However, in the summer of 2016, comes down a Supreme Court decision on a op an open and shut corruption case against the former governor of Virginia, Bob McDonald. And this was, you know, I mean, as the Supreme Court called it, tawdry. I mean, it was absolutely classic, you know, venal, uh, shady businessman who wants to gin up some kind of pharmaceutical product out of tobacco, you know, is trying to twist the governor's arm to get public institutions to perform, you know, clinical trials, something that we're in the middle of right now. And it was $185,000 worth of, you know, or something of baubles of this sort or another of Rolex watch, a wedding for his daughter, you know, rides in a private jet, loans of money, gifts of money, this kind of thing. The governor, who was no longer governor by that time, was convicted by a jury of his peers. That's a unanimous decision. He was sentenced to a jail sentence way below the federal recommended minimum standard for this kind of a, of a crime. He appealed. He lost on appeal unanimously, appealed again to the Supreme Court. So that decision comes down in the middle of the summer in 2016. And not only did the Supreme Court overturn the conviction, what really blew me away was the Supreme Court overturned it unanimously. And the opinion basically said that the United States had more to fear from prosecutors fighting corruption than it did from corruption itself. And I said, oh boy, we are cruising for a bruising. If you have that much of a divergence between ordinary people's um, understanding of what corruption is and the elite's technical legalistic definition of corruption, it means there is no longer any civic means of recourse against corruption, which means inevitably people are gonna turn to extreme measures. So, Sarah, let me just kind of push you a little bit further on this issue. You know, as you mentioned, your last book looks at the ways in which corruption fuels violent extremism, right? And, and, and you note there was this kind of received wisdom that religious fanaticism, ideology, is what was driving people across the world to engage in murderous acts of violence, and, and, and you found that not to be the case, um, that, it, that it was really corruption that was driving people towards uh, these extreme ends. So, you know, as you turn your watchful eye towards the United States, if we continue the kind of analogy, what is systemic corruption driving Americans and America towards? Oh boy, that's a big question. 
So, um, and maybe we can get into what I mean by systemic corruption yeah. next, but, but here was the really sobering realization that I came to researching this book. What I tried to do was find what um, period in, in history resembled the degree of capture by sophisticated corrupt networks, both in the United States and around the world, of the industrialized you know, political politics and economies. And the period I came up with is, you know, probably not surprisingly to anyone, um, the Gilded Age, but understood rather broadly from approximately 1870 until approximately the New Deal about 1935, which is where you start seeing reforms happening in Europe and things like that. And the features of the system are almost identical. Interwoven networks of private and public sector figures dominating, capturing the main revenue streams at the expense of, you know, human beings, of course, but also the land, what's on the land, what's under the land. I mean, the, the extortionate nature of how these systems work is, is really damaging. And of course, the costs are always externalized, right? The, the profits are captured, but the costs are externalized. So, and the networks are transnational. Um, they weave back and forth across uh, as I say, these different sectors and different areas of activity, they also weave back and forth across, I want to say, identity groupings, in particular, political identity groupings. And what really kind of gave me pause when I looked at that period was to notice not only was this syndrome um, existing in uh, across political parties in, for example, the United States, it existed across political systems. So you had the German Empire, you had the French Republic, you had the, um, you know, the English constitutional monarchy, you had the United States Federal Republic that were all pretty much acting out the same business model in terms of the political economy and countries, you know, there, just as today, countries like India, you know, and other develop, you wouldn't call them developing world countries, but frankly, colonies and close to colonies were very much the terrain of exploitation. And so that meant places like India, places like the Balkans, places like the American West. Um, and so then I asked myself, what, um, caused it to end. So number one, I found an extraordinarily parallel resort to extremism. Um, there, I think we forget, there was a massive wave of terrorist attacks in the very late 19th and early 20th century perpetrated by so-called anarchists. Now, it's an interesting movement because it actually had some thoughtful political ideas, but there were some incendiaries around the edges. There was also a lot of planted um, violence, which was not in fact perpetrated by, by um, uh, by anarchists themselves, but they did, some did explicitly espouse the use of violence. So 1920, a spectacular terrorist attack happens where? On Wall Street, <laughs> right on the doorstep of the JP Morgan offices, right on Wall Street. And in that case, the, um, the uh, motivation was very explicit against this sort of gilded age kleptocratic business model uh, and the oppression that it was subjecting the vast majority of the population to. Um, what's fascinating is if you dig around in Al-Qaeda motivations, you can find, I mean, they do talk religious issues, but they very explicitly and, and I wanna say articulately, um, from, you know, Atiyah to Osama bin Laden and get, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not espousing terrorist violence myself. I'm trying to look honestly for what some of the motivations are. 
And they talk about the corruptive lifestyle and the role of the United States in supporting and, and uh, reinforcing extortionate corrupt regimes in their home countries. So you've got two terrorist attacks aimed at drawing public attention to the evils of kleptocratic systems. Instead, what happens is that the public gets fixated on the threat posed by the terrorists themselves. And the feeling of that threat in both cases swamps anyone's concern about the threat posed by the kleptocratic system. And so everyone, you know, there's a red scare and there's an anti-terrorist scare and these things allow in both cases, the kleptocratic networks to reinforce themselves by gaining more powers, more arbitrary powers, and also gaining gigantic revenue streams. Take a look at, you know, the, the, um, suburbs around Washington, all of that stuff, not all of it, but a good half of it was built since 2001. And I myself kind of fell for it, right? I mean, I went running around the halfway around the world to Afghanistan thinking that's where the story is. Whereas, as you pointed out, the story was right there on Wall Street. In both cases, the reinforced kleptocratic networks uh, drove the world economy into a, you know, earth shattering economic breakdown within a dozen years. I mean, it, the parallels are really amazing. And just to finish off this long winded answer, the terrifying thing that I found in pursuing this parallel was then I asked, okay, well, what got us out of it in that prior 70 year period? And the answer was some of the other things that lay in store that basically the kleptocratic syndrome was driving the world towards. So you had these violent reactions, but that was the least of the security concerns in the end, I discovered. What you also had was World War I, partly caused by competition over precisely these third world kleptocratic opportunities. You had the Great Depression, as I just mentioned, you had World War II which was in large part caused by the strictures placed on, well, it was caused in large part by the strictures, but also the impacts of the Great Depression on Germany and Japan. And so, huh, I mean, man, what lay ahead was two world wars, that's two genocides, that's use of the nuclear bomb and mass starvation in Europe, a pandemic that dwarfed the size of the current one and a massive global, global economic meltdown. And so the urgency of this book is really about can we develop the degree of concern and collective solidarity that that degree of calamity usually sparks in people before we have to suffer the calamities. You know, just I want to circle back to the kind of question that you raised about, you know, kind of defining systemic yeah. corruption, um, because that's obviously really important. And you kind of gave us an insight into how you think about that. But, you know, one of the arguments of the book, Sarah, is that corruption is not an isolated scandal or a tawdry one-off case involving the former governor of Virginia. It is a deliberate mode of functioning, right? It is a feature, not a bug of the system. It is, you know, to use an analogy, it's, it's the kind of operating system of your computer, not just a file that's been downloaded onto the desktop, right? I mean, could you paint us an analytical map of the network of corruption in the United States? I mean, obviously you can't go into every nook and cranny, but as you think about the kind of major nodes, as it were, right. how would you identify what those are? So what I found was um, the degree of parallelism between the United States and countries I had looked at in the developing world. And again, I think India adds visibly a feature that I still think is is present in the United States, but I didn't really look into, which is the criminal strand, the out and out criminality. The fundamental point is these networks weave together public officials with top private 
uh, business people with um, out and out criminals. Um, and as a result, they dispose of an incredibly wide array of capabilities. That's one of the things that makes them so formidable is they have the powers that are inherent in powers and, as I say, abilities that are inherent in these different sectors. Um, in every single country, and the United States also, I have found that they, well, what I want to say is the objective of the networks is to enrich their members, pure and simple. So let me just put a pause marker in here and mention that um, one of the, you said eclectic, <laughs> one of the eclectic features of this book is it is not your typical analytical policy wonk book, although it does have that component. But I get, I try to get at the issue almost at different levels of our brains and psyches. And one of the things I've been really thinking about for quite some time has been the social status of money. And I know that sounds a bit like a cliche, but I actually think that we are living in a period which is not a constant. This, it's, it's not always the case. But currently, we're living in a period in which money is just about the sole marker of social success. And so to explore that issue, I actually drag people back into the myth of Midas, you know, the guy who everything he touched turned to gold. Well, it turns out that, first of all, the Midas touch is a curse. And we've, we've missed that completely. Like we've turned the whole myth on its head. And now we say, oh, wow, he's got the Midas touch, not realizing that, oh, yes, and therefore he brings death and destruction upon himself and his entire society. But the other fascinating thing I discovered is that Midas actually existed. And he ruled just about when and where money was invented. That is a myth about money and its unique among other ways of storing storing and transferring wealth ability to get people addicted to it in this way so that there it becomes a measure of success a measure of who's winning and the problem with that is that so what's your six figure eight figure salary millen you know well oh oh you have this many zeros you know in the forbes billionaires chart well then i have to one up you you know it's a race with no finish line it no longer has anything to do with having enough or having something that you know um and, and i just found so there's quite a lot in this book. Uh, I weave mythology through it. I weave sacred stories through it. And, and in particular, this intersection between the mythology as understood deeply, you know, sacred stories and the science, the archeology, span it's really illuminating about the power of those stories and the insights that they offer. Um, so the network's objective these days is to amass money for its members. Given that it's a network, back to the problem with the McDonald case, the quid pro quos often are not direct and individual. They're not you to me and me to you. I might you know, realize that you've got a daughter coming up and boy, wouldn't she love an internship you know, out here in West Virginia without asking you for anything. I invite your daughter. And then I've got a friend of mine who's just written, you know, their first whatever book on India. And, you know, the, the favors are deferred in time and very often indirect. And it's really the network serving, members of the network serving the network, which will in turn serve them back at some other time and place. And that's why I use, one of the reasons I use the myth of the Hydra to, um, as a metaphor for these networks, because the heads seem to be independent, but they're all serving the body. So the same body. So here in the United States, you have three key, I mean, I almost don't need to tell people, it's just so obvious, I think, but there are three revenue streams that I see captured in every single country that I have explored. And they, you know, every economy is different. You have 
dates in Tunisia are a revenue stream that was captured by the Ben Ali you know, network. But every country you see finance, energy, and high-end real estate. And that was also true in the Gilded Age. If you look at the huge trusts, you know, the U.S. Steel and things like that, you got, you know, in J.P. Morgan, you found those same three woven together. I think today you could add the industrial food, uh, agriculture and pharmaceutical world uh, and processed food, and you could add um, tech. Uh, those are some others you can add. The role of members of the network who hold public office is to bend and distort the instruments of state in their grasp to serve the network rather than serving the public interest. And so I go through a couple of those powers, you know, cutely named the power of the purse, the power of the, the power of the scales, the power of the pen. So it's interesting, you look at, you know, you look at the justice function. That serves two purposes for kleptocratic networks. Number one is the ability to punish challengers and ensure impunity for network members. And we've seen that on great display, uh, particularly the impunity side uh, in recent weeks and months. Um, but also, of course, the ability to interpret the laws. Once you have a, an elite group of nine individuals who are essentially saying what the law means, you almost don't need to control the law writing bodies anymore. And so we are in this situation where there's this quote unquote politicized, politicization of the Supreme Court. But as the McDonald case shows, I would almost say that the court's already captured so many of the relevant decisions that impact this political economic business model have been unanimous. I mean, it's just breathtaking. Um, and there was the Bridgegate case even after McDonald, which was written, the opinion was written by Elena Kagan. Um, so this is not a Democrat versus Republican issue. Sarah, um, jump in yeah. on one, sorry, just yeah, yeah. Uh, because I wanna focus your attention on one thing, which has been a through line through everything you have said. Um, and is you reserve a lot of ire in your book uh, for the campaign finance system um, and the way in which money in politics operates. And you know, sitting inside of the Beltway as I am today, as we have this conversation, we gussy up, uh, you know, talk of of, of corruption and, and, and campaign finance and lobbying, and it's very well dressed in nice suits and polite language and business cards. But but you identify it as the kind of wellspring of corruption in many ways. Um, I just want to ask you maybe quickly because there's a bunch of questions piling yeah. up. Is my last kind of intervention is you know a lot of people's takeaway from our most recent set of presidential and congressional elections is, well, maybe money actually isn't as important as we thought. We saw people like Jamie Harrison in South Carolina, Teresa Greenfield in Iowa, Siri Gideon in Maine, raise ridiculous amounts of money. Uh, and it didn't buy them love from the, from the electorate, right? All three of those and many others I'm sure we could think of uh, lost. And that prompted a flurry of opinion pieces saying, you know, uh, money may be a problem, but maybe we've overhyped it. Um, I'm sure you have a uh, a response to that. Why don't Why don't we hear it and then we'll open it up to the okay. Questions. Okay, sure. Um, so first of all, I think we should um, distinguish between signal and noise. When you talk about the impact of money, you have to think about the aggregate impact over time. So I would send everybody to the work of Thomas Ferguson, who has been systematically analyzing political contributions and results since, you know, like the 1980s. And the graphs are pretty breathtaking in terms of the direct correlation. Secondly, whether or not money always delivers outcomes. It is now the main objective of political campaigns, almost ahead of garnering votes, 
people, you know, candidates are obligated to demonstrate the degree to which they can garner money. That means that they are spending more of their time uh, catering to and listening to and in rooms with the moneyed elite than they are with ordinary voters. And that means that, you know, Again, it's not a, almost not a political party issue. It's all of the candidates have to pass this kind of money primary, and therefore they're already part of the broader pool of people who are more focused on the wealthy than on ordinary people. So uh, there are a bunch of questions, Sarah. Yeah. So let's pivot, and I'll try to group them together because okay. a few of them run Thank similar you. themes. And so we're just not hearing from the two of us. I wonder if maybe the first questioner, Holly Atkinson, would be willing to come oh, that on would be and, great. and present her question so, so we get another voice. And Holly, are you there? Would you be willing to ask your question about the link between corruption and racism? I'm here. I just can't go on camera. I've got chaos behind we me. I un uh, understand. <laughs> understand. But would you like to tell, uh, ask Sarah your question? Sure, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, I just, um, I think I, I learned on the Warren campaign, I'm, you know, late to the game, but um, uh, that the root of everything here, I mean, I knew, I've known this for years, is, is the systemic racism and the 400 years of stolen land and stolen labor. And so the corruption, I think, here may be unique. And I wonder if that, if that's, if you think that's the case, or if it's, if it's um, all of a piece, and we just have this additional problem. So is one you know, a byproduct of the other or, or the reverse. I think um, we have bigger problems, uh, you know, than, than some of these other places because we've got this embedded legacy that we've yet to address. So I just wonder what your thoughts are on, on, on that, on, on, on our I particular, really peculiar, peculiar important. situation. Yep, yep, got it. Go ahead, Sarah. Got it. Might be yeah. yeah. Um, are you guys hearing me? Because I'm seeing that my connection is unstable. We can hear you now. We can't see okay, you, but we can it, hear you. Are you hearing me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think that's a very important and um, deep question. And I would go at it this way. Uh, the last paper I wrote when I was uh, anti-corruption insurrections in half a dozen countries uh, on as many continents. And I looked at what does the kleptocratic network do to um, strike back? I mean, it doesn't take the challenge laying down, does it? And I found that the most important and effective to ensure their perennity, to, to ensure their survival, was splitting people up along the identity divides. I would say that slavery is the absolute perfect example of that and the deepest and evilest example of that, apart from the genocide of Native Americans. So it's like either genocides to crimes against humanity, you know, straight up genocide or the enslavement of people and the theft of their labor and land. And the point is, the only thing that can effectively defeat a kleptocratic network is a cross-cutting consensus and coalition of the victims. And I go into that in evolutionary terms in On Corruption in America. It's a really interesting evolutionary story about basically how Homo sapiens imposed egalitarianism on what had been a very hierarchical primate order. And so once the basically the alpha dominators <laughs> gathered together in a coalition, otherwise known as a kleptocratic network, what they have to do is split up the much broader and larger coalition of the ordinary people along identity lines. What better way than to say that a whole segment of that, of that population is not even human, is subhuman, and therefore to give the lowest you know, ranks of white people a sense of superiority over somebody 
um, and basically make it impossible for people to unite across that line while simultaneously stealing labor. Now, theft of labor happened, you know, obviously most significantly in slavery, but it was happening across the board in the 19th century, from the factories to the uh, tenant farmers, white tenant farmers, whose lives were not really a lot better than their black neighbors, except that they were able to lord it over their neighbors. This system perpetu of, of, of both um, revenue stream, a very lucrative revenue stream, and the ability to fracture the potential egalitarian consensus continued right through to today. And, I, and so I actually contest the idea that the founding problem is race. I actually think the founding problem is kleptocracy and race is one of the devastating ways that it, um, that it manifests. Uh, thanks, Sarah. We have a question from Katie Fuse, um, which is about the role that young people are playing and might play. You know, her question is, you know, is there a risk as we look out into the future that younger generations who increasingly don't look like traditional political and economic elites will non nonetheless be co-opted into these corrupt networks, or might they revert to extremist ideologies and become more revolutionary? So, you know, in other words, what role do they play in either propping up <laughs> or dismantling some of these entrenched systems of corruption in your view? Another great question. And I'm going to be a little bit provocative here, but um, I think this question connects with the previous question because I would, I I'm a little bit concerned that the overwhelming focus on identity groupings may in fact serve to, um, I, I think it may get co-opted by kleptocratic networks. And let me give you an example from Afghanistan, which is that initially, you know, the international interveners had no idea that tribes mattered in Afghanistan. Eventually, after like three years, they sort of caught on that tribes were real groupings that were essential to the Afghan social structure. At which point, Ahmed Wali Karzai, President Karzai's younger half brother, who was, you know, at the center of the kleptocratic, one of the kleptocratic networks in southern Afghanistan, realized that the Westerners had had basically twigged to, to um, tribes. So what he would do was co-opt leading members of different tribes so that his network included, you know, he could point at any shura of people that he had gathered together. You could say, well, so-and-so is in the locos eye and so-and-so is a barracks eye and so-and-so, so, you know. And so I guess my concern today is in the focus on diversity and on quote unquote looks like me, which has become a kind of catchphrase, a euphemism that I think is actually a dangerous euphemism because it may just be looks like me. What if someone who looks like me, who happens to be endowed with two mammary glands, you know, uh, in fact has been reformatted by the kleptocracy, which is offering her the types of rewards that in our society are really hard to, to turn down. So the second really important weapon that kleptocratic networks deploy is, you know, infect them with the Midas disease, right? Inject some money into their bloodstream and boy, do they start, you know, changing um, their approaches. And so I think that young people need to be quite thoughtful about what the world, what world do they want to live in versus what personal advancement do they aspire to within that world and how to balance the two in, in a way that's not entirely self-serving. So Sarah, we have two questions um, about 
kind of policy responses and our individual responsibility. Let me just uh, bookmark those for a second um, because I think we can maybe turn to that in the in in um, after we get to a question from uh, Ali Al Saka. Ali, are you there? Would you like to ask your question about America's role in fighting corruption? Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, we all know that America is a great country and it has some interventions in uh, other countries' ecosystems and uh, political and economical uh, ecosystem. So uh, according to your experience, in what degree do you think fighting corruption in America will affect the corruption in other, in other countries in the worldwide, especially the developing countries? Uh, thanks for that question. And you actually touch on why I am no longer Millen's colleague. So 2016 rolls around, and I am working in a foreign policy focused think tank on corruption. And my next planned project was going to focus on Ethiopia, at which point I said, it is just not credible as an American, you know, uh, given the system, given the state of our system here, uh, for me to go and, you know, start exploring the dynamics of corruption in Ethiopia, you know. So I left the Carnegie uh, Endowment for International Peace to focus on the United States. I think the best example um, that I could give to answer your question would be the situation in Ukraine. Right. When I was working on corruption in Afghanistan, it became impossible really to do anything serious about it, given the vertical integration of the corruption networks, which I haven't dwelled on in this conversation. But the fact was in Afghanistan, if you touched a corrupt official who was some two bit border police officer, it was going to go straight up to Karzai because that's how the deal worked that in return for the money that was flowing upwards in the system, the guys at the top of the system had to guarantee impunity for their subordinates. And so you couldn't touch anyone, you know, other than at a village level without getting Karzai involved. And once Karzai was involved, then you had to be at the highest level of the US government, right? You had to have the Secretary of State and the President of the United States solidly behind the anti-corruption, determined anti-corruption message. What happened in Afghanistan was the once people saw that Karzai was going to get involved, they all went running for the corners. People, I mean the highest levels of civilian US government um, in the State Department, in the White House, did not want this thing to blow up in their faces because Karzai was really good at using the media and splashing Afghanistan all over the front pages. And that is not what the Obama administration wanted. So we could not combat corruption effectively in Afghanistan because Washington was a wall was absent. Now imagine you are the one and only US ambassador who really takes it seriously. Because what I discovered then in my advocacy, uh, anti-corruption advocacy with the US government was the only, the only bureau in the US State Department that actually appointed an anti-corruption coordinator was European affairs. And the only embassy that really took the anti-corruption mission seriously was Ukraine. The ambassador who is in charge of that mission not only gets crickets in Washington, but is actually publicly humiliated in the most devastating way for an ambassador, which is to say she was recalled and publicly humiliated by the president of the United States. What message do you suppose that sends to kleptocrats around the world? It's not only that the United States is not going to take anti-corruption seriously, it's that the United States is actively promoting corruption around the world. So in answer to your question, I would say, and, and, and I am quite apolitical about this, as Johannes um, pointed out, I'm not trying to create a false equivalency here, but if, President-elect Joe Biden cannot figure out why it undermined US policy 
to have his son sitting on the board of a notoriously corrupt energy company in Ukraine while Biden himself was vice president of the country in charge of anti-corruption in Ukraine, why he can't see that there's a contradiction here is a big problem. Now, I do think that ostensibly, at least, the Biden administration is going to be a lot better on these issues, including internationally, than the Trump administration was. That's not hard. The question for me is going to be, will it take seriously enough its responsibility to lead by example. And that would get me to my number one recommendation to all of us in this fight, which is start with holding our own communities, be they our gender, be they our country, be they our political party, be they our religion, hold our own communities up to their highest standards. Then start looking at the other side. So, Sarah, this is a nice segue to two questions I mentioned earlier, you know, about what, what do we do, right? Yep. So Riva's question is really about, you know, what is our individual responsibility Great. Uh, at a moment in time when, you know, the social status of money, as you put it, is, is at its apex and we have a system that prizes kind of feeding these various networks instead of serving the public interest, right? So that's about kind of individual incentives. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. Johannes's question is in a similar vein, but sort of asking, you know, what are the ways in which we can think about uh, fostering a and strengthening an ecosystem that is fit to turn all of this indignation that many citizens feel, many activists feel, many scholars feel into genuine reform. So maybe you could kind of, you know, give us your thoughts on, on sort of the, the, the next steps as it were. Right. Uh, and those are great ways of framing them. I really, I really appreciate those. Um, so I do have an epilogue in On Corruption in America, which is uh, in the end kind of a grab bag because what I came out with at the end of this really distressing and sobering research was this is gonna take all of us. This really is sort of like, you know, Superstorm Sandy or something like that, where everybody is, affected and the recovery is going to take every single one of us and that means all of our disparate talents and inclinations and foibles they all have a use so find something in there and and do it um, but specifically you know and so what i've seen looking around the world is that very often when civil society mobilizes in a massive way which i do think is needed um, there's a kind of off with her head thing that happens where the focus is on the individual at the top of the kleptocratic network. And as though if that individual is toppled, somehow, you know, equity and justice will ensue. And that's never the case. And that tendency is what is so effectively captured either by spoilers or by the network itself, which merely like the Hydra sprouts a couple of new heads and reconfigures. And so that is the pattern I've seen everywhere. I noticed a, a question flash by about Tunisia and I will break with the norm and say, I actually think that's what's happened in Tunisia. I think Tunisia is now being run by a somewhat more genteel and more apparently democratic version of the same old network. Um, and again, I know that is uh, an unconventional view of Tunisia. Um, and so I think we need a variety in the myth of the Hydra, the way she was finally defeated was Heracles lopped off her heads but his younger cousin would cauterize the necks. And so that touches on Johannes's question, which is about the reforms. And what we don't have, we have a reform community and we have indignant population. What we don't have is any connection between the two. And we're actually already talking about, you know, putting our heads together about how do we connect the two? Because at the moment, the inside the beltway reform community is completely unintelligible to and disconnected from the wider population. And fundamentally, its reforms are so technocratic that they are almost invisible 
to the wider public. And so those two, even though they're real, the reforms that do take place, those two are too disconnected. As for our everyday lives, I mean, I really do think we need to interrogate this matter of money. I just wrote an email this morning to a very revered older friend of mine who's involved in, you know, a relatively benign uh, manifestation of this ecosystem. And I asked this person, I threw a question that this person has often asked back, how much is enough? How much is enough? Do you have a number in your mind? And why don't you ask yourself, what's the basis of that number? of the salary you want to make or the return on investment you want to have or the grant you want to get or the right what do you need it for are you literally considering this amount of money for things that you want that are reasonable to expect yourself to invest in your lifestyle and your children's education for example or is it a sort of equal pay for equal work kind of thing, which again, there's an equity issue there. But once you start getting into the money is a measure of success, and therefore my number has to compare with somebody else's number, then it's about using money as a substitute for status. And then you're into dangerous terrain. And so, so the first question is, what is the basis? for the target number that you have in your mind. And then the second question is, what are you willing to compromise in order to gain that, um, that number? So again, just to wail on Carnegie, um, since I now can, shortly after I left, Millen informed me that somebody was going on the board of directors that somebody was a person named uh, Ngozi Ikweala, whom I have used consistently over the, over the course of years as a sort of poster child for international kleptocracy. She, I can't, you know, I don't have evidence that she actually stole the money herself. However, she provided, presided as finance minister over the disappearance of approximately a billion dollars a month for at least 11 months in a row of Nigerian oil revenues. That is to say the money didn't even make it into the federal coffers. She's a very effective image laundering, image launderer. I know for a fact that she was a target of the Justice Department's kleptocracy initiative, but it was such a target rich environment that they went for like someone even more spectacular than her. Um, if I had been at Carnegie, I would have raised the roof about that. Um, now, but there have been plenty of times when I haven't raised the roof. There are probably other board members that I didn't raise the roof about. Why? Because I had a pretty nice salary at Carnegie. It wasn't a competitive, you know, um, a competitive billionaire salary, but it was a very comfortable one. And I guess that's what I'm asking us all to do. What are we whitewashing? What are we passing over in silence in return for our comfort? And I would say the same thing about things like, you know, Amazon and, and, and Tyson's food and things like that. These are exploitative, you know, they are members of the private sector strand in US kleptocratic networks, Tyson's in particular. Um, which is was very tightly entwined with the Clinton uh, with the Clintons, um, and continues to have an outsized role in U.S. policymaking, and reduces American farmers to indentured servitude, and utterly destroys the um, carrying capacity of our soil while sickening people because of you know inferior and chemical laden food. I mean, this is basically a criminal actor in the American sense. And so I guess what I'm asking all of us is do some things differently. I'm not asking you to martyr yourself, 
but I am saying buy that book, buy my book from your local independent bookstore and receive it, you know, in a week instead of a day. You don't need to start reading it tomorrow, not at the price of people who have to work in warehouses in diapers because they're not given bathroom breaks. Um, and I also think that we could all think about something like a, an ethics pledge, you know, that we might try to apply across the board, across political parties. Um, and just one last note on boycotts, which was brought to my attention by Zephyr Teachout, who wrote a great book also just about, that came out the same time as mine did, called Break Em Up, about monopoly. And she points out that the most effective boycotts, and this is true, are boycotts that have been in support of an explicit public policy demand. So I do think that there's a role for that kind of very focused anti-monopoly boycotting. But I also actually do believe there's room to use our spending power and our willingness to receive money in ways that can turn our economy and politics into a more humane system. Thank you, Sarah. I think that's um, a great place for us to end this conversation since we're at time. I, I want to do a couple of things before we end. I want to thank Global Integrity and the Open Gov Hub for, for hosting this on Anti-Corruption Day. I want to thank all of you for joining. I especially want to thank Sarah for everything that, that she does for writing this book, which I hope all of you will pick up if you haven't already. There are links in the chat. Um, there are several questions, Sarah, that we couldn't get to. Can uh, you send them to me? Uh, we can send them to you, but I just want to highlight them very quickly because yeah. those who asked might uh, be interested that questions about the nexus between corruption and the energy sector and the relevance Huge. for environment and climate Huge. are very much dealt with in, in, in the book. The question about big consulting, consulting firms, uh, the link between... Um, uh, kind of policy stature and the opioid industry is also explicitly tackled with the example of the Sacklers in, 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 in Sarah's book um, and, and, and much, much, much more. So um, thanks all of you for joining us, Sarah. Thanks again. Um, this was a fortuitous uh, yes, what a pleasure. reunion uh, and, and uh, it gave me great pleasure to host this conversation. Thanks, thanks for all of you for joining.